Hello, and thank you for joining today's webinar. We are ready to begin. Today's webinar is eligible for one contact hour. Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The speakers and planning committee members have disclosed no conflicts of interest. To receive contact hours for this CPD session, participants are required to attend the webinar and complete the evaluation form, which will be, which will be emailed to all attendees approximately one week after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. Following the presentation, we will have time for a question and answer session. You'll see on your GoToWebinar control panel that you can send a message through the questions feature. This is where you can type in any question you'd like to pose to the presenter. Be sure to hit send so the message makes it to us. To test out this feature, please submit the state or country you are from. We would like to thank Sigma and QSIN for today's collaborative webinar. We would also like to thank our presenter for sharing her expertise with us today. Our speaker is Dr. Hansbro. Dr. Hansbro came to academic nursing after years of bedside critical care experience and healthcare administrative leadership. She is, dedicated, she is dedicated to advancing the art of nursing education by designing evidence-based curriculum. She fosters the professional development of the School of Nursing faculty as they teach and mentor the next generation of nursing students. She has been an active member of Sigma since 2007. Now let's go ahead and get started with today's presentation. Hello everyone, thank you for joining me this evening, this evening for me anyway, um, in this webinar about clinical faculty's role in licensing and accreditation at your schools of nursing. So this is meant to be an introduction specifically for clinical faculty um, as you start to understand licensing and accreditation. And the focus will be on the elements that are most related to the work that you do as clinical faculty teaching in undergraduate nursing programs. By the end of this, e this presentation, I hope that you are able to distinguish the authority of licensing boards versus accreditation organizations to oversee schools of nursing. I also would like you to be able to recognize the essential work of clinical faculty, which supports the licensing requirements, and be able to describe the elements of licensing and accreditation, which are most related to the work of clinical faculty. And finally, I'd like you to be able to associate the accreditation process to ongoing program quality improvements efforts that may be going on at your school. Before I get too far, I'd like to know a little bit about you so I can tailor this presentation to who you are. So there's two poll questions in a poll I would like you to answer. One is the school of your role at the School of Nursing. Are you a full-time faculty, a part-time faculty, not a faculty member yet, or just a curious bystander? And what do you teach? So I see that most of you, have over half of you are full-time faculty, another 21% are part-time faculty, and about 23% of you aren't a faculty member yet, but you're curious about being a faculty member. Thank you for your replies, that helps me out. And about 70% of you, it looks like, teach both clinical and didactic courses. So now that I know a little bit about you, let's go on to talking a little bit. I want to give you a little bit of background on me. So I am a Colorado native, and I went to the University of Northern Colorado for my bachelor's degree. 
I went on to get my master's degree and my PhD at the University of San Diego. And as was mentioned, my clinical expertise, expertise has been in the care of burn patients. At this time, I am the interim director of the School of Nursing at the California State University, San Marcos. And our program has a number of, of avenues for nurses. One is a traditional bachelor's of science and nursing degree. We also have an opportunity for LVNs to move into that. Our accelerated program is a couple of years long. And then we have a fully online RN to BSN program. And we have a master's program that focuses on the nurse practitioner. And we are in the process of developing a DMP program. So my first accreditation experience was back at the University of Colorado when I was the nurse manager of the burn center there. And we had what was then the Joint Commission for the Accreditation of Hospital, now the Joint Commission, there as well as the Colorado Health Department. It was our licensing board. And I learned something during this accreditation review and that's that they are likely to ask me a question that I don't know. And that's okay, as long as I'm well prepared and if they ask me something I don't know, I know where to go find the answer to that. And at this time in burn patient care, we were giving patients baths in these large tubs. And the person from the health department asked me if I knew if it was a backflow protected device. And I had no idea what he was talking about. But they went off to do something else. And by the time they came back, I had found the plant. Um, plumbing fellow and he had given me the correct information to share with them. So you never know what you're going to get asked. Um, you just have to find out the answer for them. In 1985, I migrated to California and was the nurse manager at the University of California, San Diego Regional Burn Center. And at the time, I did a number of accreditation reviews with the Joint Commission and the California Department of Health as our licensing board. In 2010, I moved to the academic side of things and became faculty at my current school, CSUSM. And since I have been there, have been through some accreditation reviews. So accreditation for our school is through the Commission on Collegiate Nursing Education, which is different than the Joint Commission for Hospitals. And then we also have a regional accreditation we do through the Western Association of Schools and Colleges, the Senior College and University section. Our licensing board is not the California Department of Health as it is for hospitals, but it is the California Board of Registered Nursing. So, so similar agencies doing similar things, but a little bit different. So tell me a little bit about you. I'd like to know what your role in licensing and accreditation has been at the clinical site where you work, if you work there, a healthcare organization that you either currently work at or have worked at in the past. So are you responsible for preparing it, participated as a unit leader, staff nurse, or have you been successfully avoiding interaction with Joint Commission surveyors and licensing board representatives? Okay, so 85% of you have had some interaction with a accreditation licensing review at a healthcare organization. Most of you, 50% um, participated as a staff nurse and a few of you have had to prepare for it or participated as a unit leader. That helps me understand a little bit about your experience so I can relate this to your, the experience as a school of nursing accreditation and licensing. What you will find out is that the, those processes are not really that different between healthcare organizations and schools of nursing. Both of them have to have a mission, vision, and philosophy, have policies and procedures that all staff know about. 
be able to demonstrate the qualifications of the nurses, whether they're working in a hospital or they're teaching in a school of nursing. We both have to be able to measure the satisfaction of those who we serve. So in a healthcare organization, it's the patients and clients. In a school of nursing, it's our students and the public. We both have to abide by licensing rules in a healthcare organization, it might be the number of patients. In schools of nursing, it's the number of students that we can have. We both have to keep a lot of records and those records are considered legal documents. And we also, both entities, must demonstrate continuous quality improvement. We have to be able to demonstrate how we have identified problems or what our ongoing method is to do that, those opportunities for improvement. We have to demonstrate the cause of the problem, perhaps do a root cause analysis. We have to find and implement a solution, analyze the results of the solution and try to hold those gains if it's a good solution or find something else to do if we were not able to solve a problem. So now tell me what your experience has been with licensing and or accreditation reviews at your school of nursing. Did you help write a self-study? Were you responsible for gathering data? Did you participate in a reviewer's visit? Or have you not done either of those things? Okay, so a few of you have helped write a self-study, so that's that's excellent, um, and or been responsible for gathering some of the information or participated, but a little more than half of you haven't participated yet in a licensing or accreditation review at your school of nursing. So for some of you who have participated in these things, this will be a review, but for others of you, this will be perhaps new information. Either way, I hope you get something from this that you can take forward into your work. So we're gonna start by distinguishing the authority that licensing boards have versus accreditation organizations to oversee our schools of nursing. Boards of registered nursing administer the NCLEX exam, which is written by the National Councils of State Boards of Nursing. They, based on passing that exam, they issue licenses, which are a legal authority to operate or to function as a registered nurse. So the boards have the responsibility to uphold the law and the associated regulations or the rules that go along with that. They have the power to levy fines or to revoke licenses for breaking that law. In contrast, accreditation organizations establish performance standards that they want to see us achieve. They come and conduct program reviews based on those standards, and they commend us when we do well, or they suggest improvements when there's things that we've missed or we could do better. Depending upon the result of their review, they may withhold accreditation or they may give a provisional accreditation with suggestions and tell us they'll be back in a few months or a month and let us know what we they will have to submit a report on how we intend to meet that standard or what we intend to do to improve. So accreditation organizations I've always viewed as letting them know where we stand with the organizational standards having them help us make sure what we do is correct and work with work with us where the boards of registered nursing are a legal entity enforcing the law. So what are the essential work things that clinical faculty do which supports licensing requirements? So again, the state boards are governmental agencies. They are at some level of the government depending, and it varies depending upon your state. 
they are responsible to enforce the state's Nurse Practice Act, which has the regulations and the rules in it that pertain to that law so that the law can be enforced. They have oversight of nurse licensure and they have oversight of schools of nursing licensure. So my question to you now is, do you know where to find the Nurse Practice Act for the state you are you're licensed in? And have you read that Nurse Practice Act? Wow, 87% of you know where to find your Nurse Practice Act. That is fabulous. And 74% of you have read it, so that's excellent as well. It's an important document, and so it is good that so many of you know where to find it and you've read it. And if you haven't done that, it's something to think about doing moving forward. Because I live and work in California and am licensed in California at this point, I'm going to use California as an exemplar, knowing that your state licensing Practice Act might be a little bit different than mine, but the elements are generally very similar. So again, nurse boards of nursing are a state agency somehow within your government. In California, the BRN is part of the Department of Consumer Affairs and it licenses and regulates the nurses in California. It has a mission to protect the health and safety of consumers by promoting quality registered nursing care. The Nurse Practice Act gives the board the authority to investigate complaints, take disciplinary action against registered nursing. And these investigation and disciplinary functions are handled by the board's enforcement division. So they do that as well as make sure that we are abiding by the license specific to us. So this is the Board of registered nursing in California, and this is our Nurse Practice Act, and it falls in the California Business and Professional Codes. And if you scroll down to all of the sections of this, you see that there is one specific for nursing schools, and I'm sure there's one similar in your state. So if we look then at the pre-licensure nursing program, we see that one of the things we find are faculty qualifications and changes. And in this section in the California code, which is the rules and regulations, there is very specific minimum qualifications that are necessary for the different roles in a school of nursing, whether it's the director or an instructor or a content expert or whatever it might be. The elements of qualifications include things such as education, the teaching experience the person has, their administrative experience, if they are going to be a director or an assistant director, and then the direct patient care experience. So here in California, whenever I hire someone, a new faculty member, I actually have to submit to the Board of Registered Nursing a form that I fill out that demonstrates that this person I'm hiring meets these elements of qualification, the minimum qualifications for whatever level I am hiring that person into. Not every board of nursing requires this, but it does in California. The other list in the pre-licensure program for the code, which is important to look at, is the faculty's responsibilities. So in the faculty responsibilities, the first thing it says 
that faculty are accountable for instruction, evaluation of students, and planning and implementing the curriculum content. But it also says that faculty must participate in an orientation program that includes at least the program's curriculum, policies and procedures, strategies for teaching, and student supervision and evaluation. And it states that they must, faculty must be clinically competent in the nursing area in which he or she teaches. In California, a clinical faculty must have taught in that clinical area within the last, or worked within that clinical area within the last five years. So the boards of registered nursing belong to the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. And this is where NCLEX is written. Um, as well as other things that they do. But the National Council is over, an oversight, if you will, to bring the boards together for they can have some agreement on commonalities, such as the NCLEX exam. So in some ways, they are sort of the standards for the upholders of the law. And they are, the National Council is accredited themselves to develop standards. So there's an accreditation of the organization that oversees the boards of registered nursing. So it's quite kind of a long list of everybody getting oversight by somebody. But this is a good thing because it means that there are some standards that are accountable for all of us across states. And that's important because of the nurse licensure compact. So the nurse licensure compact allows nurses to hold a multi-state license. So if I am licensed in California, I'm not in, a, I'm in a non-nursing licensure compact. So my license may not be applicable in other states. And I've had that happen with our students who want to get a job outside of California when they start working. And so we need to send their information about their transcripts that they've graduated to the state Board of Registered Nursing where they want to work. So this, this multi-state license is really important for nurses um, so that they don't have to get licensed in multiple states. But there are a few states, including California, that are not part of that compact. And then for advanced practice nurses, there are um, states that are um, not part of it either. So it's important this is an important thing to understand that some nurses may not have licenses in various states and may need to be relicensed. So let's turn our attention a little bit to accreditation organizations where the standards for performance are established and, and they do the reviews to see whether or not the standards are met. So there are many accrediting organizations, both regional and national, that a school of nursing might use to further accreditation. Does it matter if they're accredited? Yes, it does. It's important to students because the transfer of their credits for graduate school may not be transferable if the school that they attended for their undergraduate degree is not accredited. Also, some employers will not hire a nurse who graduates from a school that was not accredited and some grant, grant funding eligibility does not is not there if a school the person graduated from is not accredited. So it's important that schools go through the accreditation process. Let's talk a minute about the elements of licensing and accreditation, which are most relevant or related to the work of clinical faculty. So, we all work to contribute to student success. And clinical faculty must have that clinical knowledge. That is so very important. But clinical faculty also need to have knowledge of pedagogy, need to have ongoing teaching skill development. I learned when I made the shift from practice to academia that the things that I thought I did pretty well as a preceptor for new graduate nurses would be exactly what I needed to do for teaching undergraduate students. And what I found is that those two things don't necessarily transfer over straight across. So it's important that clinical faculty who are experts in their clinical field 
do receive mentoring and some continuing education in how to teach undergraduate students and graduate students. One of the best ways to do that I have found is to belong to professional nursing education organizations, AACN, Sigma, the National League for Nursing, and if you're interested in simulation, the Society for Simulation and Healthcare, those are just examples. When you belong to these organizations, you step away from your clinical expertise a little bit and you start to get into the elements of how to be, how to be improving or learning more about how to teach. It's also important that you understand your organization's program learning outcomes. Each school of nursing has outcomes that they want students to have at the end of their program. Some schools base these on the baccalaureate essentials that are published by AACM. At my school, we had not done that, although in this next year, we are doing a curriculum revision and we will be adopting those as our program learning outcomes. Along with that goes a curriculum map to meet those. So it tells you where the course you're teaching falls in that map. And that's important to know so that when you're teaching your course, you know whether this is an introductory course or it's an intermediate course, or is this a course where you expect students to be able to demonstrate their knowledge at an advanced level. And it's also important that clinical faculty participate in faculty meetings and in school of nursing committees so that there's the opportunity for mentorship and to understand the various elements of licensure and accreditation, the work that is going on all the time at your school of nursing. Just like in the healthcare organization, in academia, we need to be continuously prepared for the standards that we need to meet for accreditation licensure. So we have to have that philosophical foundation. Our policies and procedures need to be up to date and our faculty need to have those things easily available to them. The organizational chart needs to be clear. Faculty credentials have to be documented. We have to be able to demonstrate that our clinical site is suitable for students learning, and we have to have standards for our simulation suites. Just like in the healthcare we, organizations, we have to have record keeping. We have to keep our syllabi, student evaluations, and we have to have elements of how we support student processes. So in our school, for example, we have a process that talks about how we help a student succeed who might be having difficulties and be in academic jeopardy. These are all things that are important for a licensing and an accreditation review. These are things that will be asked about. We also have to have our program evaluation plan that needs to include faculty and student satisfaction, employer satisfaction, and an evaluation of our clinical sites. And finally, we have to be able to demonstrate that we are assessing the success of our program to achieve our program learning outcomes and that we have a demonstrated quality improvement process. So let's associate those accreditation processes to ongoing program quality improvement. So here I'm just demonstrating two um, different organizations. One is CCNE, which is what my organization uses, and the other is NLN criteria on the right side. So one of the elements that they will look for, and many of these are also required by licensing, is NCLEX pass rates. Both of these organizations expect 80%. My Practice Act in California for my licensing is 75%, but our accreditation standards a bit higher. They will both look at program completion rates, whether that be retention or graduation rates depends upon your organization. In the NLN version, the program sets those target rates. CCNE expects 70% completion. There's an element of student feedback. NLN wants to see satisfaction with the program. CCNE that says is optional, although we do do that at my school. There's a question about new graduate employment. 
CCNE requires 70% in 12 months. In NLN, you can set the target rate. New grad employment is an interesting element to be monitoring. Um, I recently read an article in the National Council of State Boards of Nursing Regulatory Journal that is questioning whether or not new grad employment really speaks at all to the quality of our program because someone could be hired and let go in two months or in three months. So it isn't necessarily a good indicator of our program quality. However, right now it is still required. Employer satisfaction is also something that is optional for CCNE. They want to see it at NLN and it is required in my state board. Again, for us, collecting this information is really very difficult. So I don't know that we'll whether or not that'll be something that we change in the future with our state board. And then the terms of accreditation vary. Um, in in CCNE, it's for five years, and then after five years, you do another review, and then it's good for 10 years. Um, NLN has slightly different timeframes for their initial review and their continuing review. But there are some common quality indicators in all of this, and collects past rates, certainly. Pattern of student satisfaction, patterns of graduates meeting the community needs by employment, evidence of action taken on problems, identified that those are identified in our program's total evaluation plan. And the evidence for those, of course, are listed here on the left. Easy to get our NCLEX pass rates, those are publicly published. Attrition rates, you have to have an active way that you're you're tracking that. And and we do, we we look at completion rates a little differently. We, a student might step out for a semester and come back in. We still count them as completing their program, but we have to be able to track that. We look at resources surveys, um, mostly about if things are available. We include that in some of our satisfaction surveys. We've done textbook surveys to see students using our textbooks, and we've used that to change sometimes our textbooks, what we're using. Um, so it depends what works, what you need in your particular organization at that time, what you might be surveying. We do look at our program graduation surveys, end of program, we ask satisfaction, look at graduate performance for um, getting a job, and then the clinical facility evaluations. So there's a number of things that, that we actually collect so that we are able to demonstrate that we meet the benchmarks. So I need to know, have you seen evidence of these type of benchmark data being collected at your school? So 69% of you are aware and have seen evidence of those benchmarks at your school. So that's very good. For those of you who haven't but know that it's available, maybe look around for it. Um, and some of you don't recall it being mentioned. But again, some of you also haven't been teaching. So that might be part of the reason for that answer. So I'm going to share a little, just one quick example of a student satisfaction survey that we distributed. So this was a survey that we sent for a couple of years and it had a lot of questions on it, which number one, we learned to eliminate some of these. We really looked at the ones that ended up not having items that were actionable. In other words, some of these things, could we do anything about? If it wasn't something that was actionable, then we, decided not to include it in future surveys. Uh, one of those was a sense of cohort community. How students interrelate with each other, faculty have some influence over, but not a lot. And it really wasn't something that we could change. So that was one we removed. 
Um, classroom and laboratory space is also one that we were interested in at a time, but that was we had fixed that, so it was something that we didn't want to continue going forward, or we had a plan to fix that, or there were limitations in what we could do. But what we did find, there were some things, com some common themes here. This survey also included a qualitative piece, so we had a lot of comments. So one of the issues was program flexibility. Another was course evaluation methods, teaching strategies, and faculty communications. Those were the four that we felt we could do something about. So we looked at the students' concerns, those four things, and we had also done a faculty satisfaction survey. So I looked at the themes in the faculty satisfaction survey and sort of compared them to the ones in the student concerns to see if there was some way these were crossing over. Were there things that the faculty felt they needed that would also impact improving the issues that students had concerns for? So for the faculty survey, what we saw was they needed more mentoring, there needed to be improved communications at the school in general, amongst the faculty, amongst the leadership, and amongst the staff, and that they found our meetings were not helpful at all. So again, looking at our improvement model, trying to identify the problems, determine the causes, and now we were up to finding solutions. So if we improved faculty satisfaction, we felt we would improve some of these student satisfaction items. So we started a faculty mentoring program that included a very detailed faculty orientation. And if you think back a couple of slides ago when I talked about what our board, our Nurse Practice Act in California said we needed to do was provide orientation. And we had to take a hard look at the fact that we weren't doing a very good job at that. So even though it had to become a budget item, we decided to have one of our very skilled faculty be run a faculty orientation program every semester. She gets release time to do that. She meets with them on the start of their program, the start of their course. She follows them throughout that first semester and is a mentor for them. We also decided that we needed to do some faculty workshops, that our faculty, while we wanted them to be attending educational things about teaching, we found that they were still wanting to attend educational things about their clinical work. So we decided to do faculty workshops and we now do them two times a year and we are able to give CEUs for that. So we just did one on Tuesday, um, which was about um, teaching online since we're doing more of that now. And we also included some introduction to the next generation of NCLEX. So we had a great three and a half hour workshop on Tuesday. So that's now become embedded in our program. We also decided to restructure our meetings and we have a timekeeper. We have an agenda that is announced ahead of time now and Zoom attendance is optional, which has been a real important addition. And we started doing that a year and a half ago because so many of our faculty live quite a ways away from our campus. Um, driving to campus to a meeting and then leaving was not always conducive to getting people to participate. That has really improved our attendance at faculty meetings. So by doing these things, these workshops, orientation, bringing faculty together in a better way, more productive way, the teaching strategies I think have improved. We've had many conversations about our evaluation methods so that faculty can learn from each other. And we have worked very hard to improve student communications as well. We've made that important in orientation and follow up with that. We also have found that this is getting faculty together is a valuable forum to address topics of importance. And just quickly, I'll share with you that our faculty workshop last in um, January of this year, we brought faculty into our simulation suite and we sort of turned the tides on them. We had a case study uh, or an unfolding clinical day for clinical faculty. And we had our simulation set up. I brought in some of our student workers who participated as student volunteers, as the actors. And they were, of course, told ahead of time what they were supposed to do 
perhaps incorrectly to see how the faculty responded. And faculty were, you know, being watched just like students are in simulation. And then we debriefed and talked about what went well, suggestions for how things could go better. And I have to tell you that it was an amazing experience. Faculty have continued to rave about it. And if we were face to face again right now and could be on campus, we would have done that again. It was so well received and faculty felt they learned an awful lot from it. So just in summary, to wrap up this portion, I just want to sort of review what your role is as clinical faculty to contribute to licensing and, and accreditation being prepared for that. So the number one thing is to show up and know what's going on at your school. That is so very important. The second thing is to document carefully. Document the feedback you give to a students on their assignments needs to be very clear. Your communication with students needs to be in a consistent way. Um, we have, um, through our online learning management systems, that's how faculty communicate with students, so we always have a record of that. And remember that your assessments of student performance, your communication, all of that are legal documents. And while we might like to believe that we will never need those for a legal action, the fact is it comes up. And we also need to be able to demonstrate our expertise at doing these things when we have a licensing or accreditation review. We want to show that faculty are really good at this. Be familiar with your licensing and accreditation requirements at your school of nursing and do whatever you can to support those quality improvement efforts. A lot of times this is participating in those committees where these discussions are occurring. So participating in those committees is very important. And then include nursing education topics in your professional continuing education. Attend a conference, attend a webinar like you were doing today, something that will help you improve your teaching. And then lastly, the biggest thing, your clinical faculty teach well so that your students do learn a lot from you and see you as a role model that they can take forward into their professional career. At this point, I'm going to open this up for any questions that you might have, and I think you can put those in your question box, and Megan from STTI will be monitoring that. We have a few questions. You had mentioned reading our Nurses Practice Act. Where can I find this? So I would suggest, because it will be part of your BRN, that you go to the Board of Registered Nursing in your state, and you should be able to find a link to that document at your BRN site. If you can't, I would Google it and say, Nurse Practice Act for whatever state you live in, and that should bring it up for you. Thank you. Let's keep those questions coming. You had mentioned being well prepared for the self-study. What are your best tips to writing and preparing for the self-study? So, I loved having a review when I was managing the Burn Center because we did these things all the time. And I think that's the most important thing about being prepared. If this is how you are living your life at your school with your, you know what the standards are, you know what the expectations are, and you have processes in place that those things are always being done, then when the, you have time for a review, you have the information. And I'll give you an example of when it has gone south for us. So we realized during one of our review preparations that we had totally lost the thread on preceptor preparation. In California, we're required to document the preceptors for our students are qualified to precept. And they have to EV, they're taking a preceptor course or they have to take one that we offer through an outside entity. And we realized that for quite some time, that outside entity had not existed, that their site was down. So we had preceptors who had not done that. So that was one we lost sort of track of and had to scramble to bring that back on. So much of this is just making sure that there are folks in your school of nursing, faculty, tenure track faculty, I have a lot of lecturers and they are fabulous, do a lot of this as well. And some of our staff who 
kind of own some of these pieces. So they're always keeping those things up to date, keeping us on task, knowing if something is not working so that we can repair that well in advance of ever having a review. If you are having difficulty recruiting faculty and retaining faculty, is it a good time to go for the ACEN? So if you are at a school of nursing and it's not accredited, then you want to kind of look into that and figuring out how you can meet those standards. It will be harder to recruit faculty to a non-accredited school. However, um, work on the accreditation and let faculty know that you are moving in that direction and that you are looking for faculty who are enthusiastic and want to be part of the advancing of your program. So sometimes it matter, it's a bit of a sales job to get people to realize they can participate in helping you get there. Did that answer that question? It says, we have increased our simulation to 50%. How does the ACEN feel about that? So we are in California, our Nurse Practice Act for schools of nursing requires that we have 25% simulation in laboratory and 75% face-to-face. Under the current situation with COVID and the cancellation of clinicals, we have not been able to do that. So we have an emergency waiver from our governor that was put into place in March that will run through the end to end of the fall semester. That allows us 50-50. So we are currently looking at that. I think that is something we will hopefully continue in California. So one of the things that we're doing at my school right now is the um, Society for Simulation and Healthcare has the standards that are required for be to be accredited for, for simulation. And so we are looking at those standards right now. We are writing a self-report to see where we are with that. So if, again, the standards are out there, so if you want to make sure that your organization is up to par, pull those standards down. Those are available at that website, the Society for Simulation Healthcare. You can get the um, standards that they expect. You can start doing a self-study based on those to see whether or not you're where you need to be for that. But I think in California, we will end up there that to be 50-50, they're going to require our simulation programs or the parts of our program will require to be accredited for that. We have a virtual we have a virtual site visit in the spring. Any tips on this? Do you think it's going to be much different? So we are actually looking at a virtual site um, review in the spring as well for our um, master's program from uh, we'll be having a site review by our board. I don't I don't know. We met with our um, folks at the board a couple of weeks ago to see what they thought that would look like. I am not sure what that's going to look like. I think it's going to be a lot of Zooming. Um, I'm honestly envisioning taking an iPad and walking around our School of Nursing because there's things that they physically need to see. And I don't know how else we're going to do that. I don't really want to try to do a preliminary recording of a tour of the School of Nursing. I'd rather have it be live. So we are looking at how we could basically do FaceTime with our Board of Registered Nursing, which seems a little crazy, but maybe that's what we're going to have to do. All the documents are still going to have to be there, but it's that, that they like to walk around and look at stuff. And so I think that live ability to do that's going to be important. Keep those questions coming. Should a GN wait to start working to gather CNE hours for licensing? So I'm assuming you say by GN you're talking about a graduate, a, a new graduate nurse. So you don't need CEUs for licensing at that point. You just need to go take the BRN, the, the NCLEX exam, and then your practice act will tell you how often you have to be recertified. In California, we have to 
provides 30 hours of continuing education for every two years. And periodically they audit you. You don't always have to turn it in, but mine had to be turned in a couple of years ago. So I love the fact that you want to do continuing education. That just is terrific. But for a graduate, for a recently graduated nurse, um, just get that license and then go from there. You had mentioned clinical faculty must have worked in their specialty practice area within the past five years. Must they continue working in their specialty practice area once they assume a clinical faculty role? And are most clinical faculty working in both clinical and academic settings? That's a great question. Um, I have a vast majority of my faculty are lecturers. So and, and they teach in the clinical setting. I have some that have not been bedside working for some time, but because they every semester take clinical students to a clinical site and provide direct patient care, the board considers that as, as working at the clinical site. But I will say that of my clinical faculty that take students clinically, probably 70% of them work part-time for me and they continue to work clinically at the bedside. So it it's kind of a mixture, but the board's very strict about that. They want to know that you have clinical expertise in what you were teaching students to do. So for myself, I haven't been at the bedside for a while. So if I was going to want to go back and teach at the clinical bedside, I'd need to go take a refresher course and I'd have to go figure out how I was going to be mentored by someone at the bedside. So it, it, they're very strict about it. But again, my clinical faculty who don't actually have a job at a healthcare organization, they have been teaching bedside every semester for the majority of their assignment, and the board has been okay with that. But again, this is a decision that is made by your Board of Registered Nursing. So you need to make sure you know what the Practice Act says in your state. Do you have to be a CNE to work in the clinical setting? No, my CNE is a certified nurse educator. And so um, that just means that I've taken the certification exam and done the additional education to be more knowledgeable about continue about teaching nursing students. Um, different certifications for different things. At one time I had an executive nurse leadership certification because at that time I was an executive nurse leader in an organization. But now my focus is on education, so I'm a CNE. But I will tell you that CNE is a certification that comes from NLN and there is a specific certification at ELN for clinical faculty. And I am really encouraging my clinical faculty to take that certification exam. I think that again, it helps you because you are getting that didactic knowledge of clinical teaching that will prepare you um, to not only take that certification exam, but it also says that you have that level of knowledge about what you are doing, which is so very important. So you can go to the NLN website and you can see the certification exam for a clinical nurse instructors. Does your CNE have to be renewed regularly? Yes, all certification exams have to be renewed regularly. And there are always requirements for those things and you just have to keep up with it, just like whether it's your critical care certification or your med surge certification or your um, emergency department nurse certification or my CNE, whatever it is, yes, those all require periodic updates. Please feel free to type in any additional questions that you have. BON outline faculty requirements and also require faculty development be offered or required. Does this also apply to the part-time adjunct clinical faculty and do they have to participate in faculty development? So our Board of Registered Nursing doesn't distinguish how much you work. They don't care whether you're full-time or part-time. They expect that if you are working as a nursing faculty that you do participate in those things. They don't make any distinction. My own faculty, I have a lot of faculty who are part-time and 
I do expect them to participate in faculty meetings, or at least if they're not there, I expect them to read the minutes, just like you would in a, if you were a staff nurse in a hospital. I expected my staff nurses to attend staff meetings or to read the minutes, same thing. So my, my we don't, our lecturers, we don't refer to them as adjunct, but those terms are, are interchangeable. Um, so yes, they are, they do participate and they're required to participate in continuing education and be current in their area of practice, which is both clinical and their area of practice is teaching as well. We have to think about that as also an area of nursing expertise. Thank you. Do you have any last pieces of advice for our audience tonight? Just, uh, I think more than anything, it's just to say thank, thank you for the work that you do educating this next generation of nurses. Um, it, it can be challenging sometimes, but um, it's immensely rewarding. And um, I, if you've had this experience like I have where students have come back to you and, and let you know that they really appreciated you and you made an impact in their, their professional growth um, as a nurse, they remember having you as a faculty member, that's, uh, that's always nice to hear. So I thank you for what you do and, and go out there and do it well. Thank you so much to our presenter today for all this great information. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with this audience and we look forward to hearing more from you in the future. As a reminder to our attendees, please submit the state or country you are from in the questions feature. We hope you enjoyed this webinar. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars, podcasts, and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful evening.